Hello, buddies, fellow Franco fans, and fans of the Franco Observer podcast. I am your host, Jason Rudy, from Desperate Visions Productions, from Sacramento, California. Desperate Visions Productions is a Sacramento-based film production company. Done 12 films so far since uh, 2007. Um, took a hiatus for the last two years, but hope to be back in 2021 with uh, at least one or two films. Have some films already written and um, have some things already moving in the pipelines. But uh, yeah, with this pandemic and the corona, COVID-19, it's really halted a lot of things. But uh, other friends of mine are doing productions and I see other things moving forward. So I'm going to attempt to uh, start up again in 2021. So you have reached the Franco Observer podcast and you have reached Jason Rudy, and you have reached episode 10. And this episode 10, we're doing the film Downtown. Uh, Downtown is film number 70 from Jess Franco. Uh, The title of it is Downtown. It's a West German theatrical title uh, production in Switzerland, 1975, uh, through Dietrich. Original theatrical title in Country of Origin is Downtown. Uh, Alternative titles. Die Nachten Popan der Unterwelt, Downtown, German DVD, The Naked Dolls of the Underworld, Downtown. Downtown, Die Nachten Popan der Unterwelt, Switzerland DVD, uh, Le, Pier, Le Prutens de la Ville Basse, Belgian Theatrical, The Whores from Downtown. Cessore, uh, Le Pornoville, uh, that was the title of the contracts and correspondence tonight in Pornoville. The German shooting title on contract between Franco and Dietrich was Rote Lippin, Schwarze Steifel, uh, also Red Lips and Black Boots, and Black Nylons and Wild Angels. Is. And let's see. Um, unconfirmed titles, The Lower Depths. Uh, okay, production company on this is Elite Films, um, AG, in Zurich. The theatrical dis- distributor is uh, Avis, Wilmer, Avis Wilmerleck, uh, Southwest West Germany. A timeline on this. Uh, the contracts were signed for it in August 12th of 1975. Shooting in B- Belleu sur Mer in August tw- 18th to the 25th, uh, one week in 1975. Then they shot four days from August 26th through the 30th in Nice. And then they shot on sets in Zurich in September of 75. And the last day of shooting in Zurich was October 4th of 75. I got the German X certificate in June 2nd of 76, and it finally played theatrically on June 23rd of 1976 in Germany, and then later in August of 1978 in Zurich. Um, This film is titled Downtown, one word, but there's also on some of the things, on-screen text layout and some of the is ambiguous. Some of it shows a gap between the words down and town to show uh, two words, but it's pretty much one word is what they kind of went through. And on the uh, Ask Hot Elite DVD, uh, it's also as, as on the, I'm sorry, the Blu-ray, it's uh, one word as well. Um, let's see. Uh, theatrical running time on this in Germany is 74 minutes, 29 seconds. And the Blu-ray uh, running time of the Ascot Elite is 80 minutes and 59 seconds. That's the version we watched was the Ascot Elite uh, Blu-ray version uh, that I got through Amazon, through Davadi Marketplace. Um, they have quite a few Franco titles. If you're in America, uh, that's a good place through Amazon to check them out. Um, they're about, you know, 25 to 35 bucks, somewhere around there. Depending on the title, they got quite a few of them. Um, let's see what else we want to talk about. This uh, the director on this, of course, is Jess Franco. On this, he's billed as Wolfgang Frank. So uh, in Bear Behind Bars, he's Rick DeConnect, and in this, he's Wolfgang Frank uh, on the screen credit as director. Uh, he's also a writer on this, but and also he's billed as Wolfgang Frank. Uh, the producer on this, Erwin C. Dietrich, is listed as E.C. Dietrich. Uh, it's an elite film. That's why it's on Blu-ray through Ascot Elite, hence the title. Uh, production 
uh, director of photography is Jess Franco, and he's also using the uh, name David Kuhn again, K-H-U-N-N-E. Uh, he's used this name before um, in other productions. So, yeah, on that one, he's on the Swiss Press book. Uh, production manager in this Switzerland is Paul Grau. Editor on this was Peter Baumgartner. Um, the music is by Walter Baumgartner, and it's produced in the Elite Film Studios in Zurich. World Sales is Elite Films AG Zurich. Um, the assistant director in France, uncredited, is George Cazell. Uh, still photographer is Ramon Ardid. That was um, Lena Romay's husband at the time. And let's see. Uh, cast on this, Jess Franco is the lead in this film. The second film he's a lead on. Uh, Exorcism was the first, and uh, this is the second one. And then he also did uh, more after this, like uh, Sadist and uh, Notre Dame and, and many others. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, he's... Uh, He's the lead in this, but he's not billed as Jess Franco. His credit is as Frank Manera, M-A-N-E-R-A. So, yeah, he has three different credits so far, different names. Uh, I'm sorry, no, just yeah, Wolfgang Frank, and then uh, David Kuhn, and then Frank Manera. Yeah, so he has three th- three names as this and not his own. That's cool. So, yeah, he's he's the lead in this. Um and which is actually pro- appropriate for this. And he's playing Algino Al Pereria. Um, that's a character he is. I think this is the first appearance of him. And uh, he's a character that would show up in many of his later films. Uh, it's a reoccurring character. And he used it all the way up until the end of his career in like Al Pereria versus the Alligator Women. And uh, yeah, he uses dead Robert, For- Robert F- Foster plays him. And. Uh, other people play the character so it's cool but that's like a that's like his gumshoe character um lena romay is in this of course she's uh cynthia ramos also known as annette stage name as cynthia labelle the beautiful favorite of mine martine steedle is in it as martina domingo is her credit uh yeah she's always martine or martina which is cool uh, she's Martine, also uh, in the fall in the next film we watch, uh, Slaves, um, Dysclav Nevin. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, yeah, so she's uh, as Martina Domingo. She plays Lola, Cynthia's lover, associate, stage name, Sexy Rexy. Uh, Eric Falk as Eric Falk. He plays Carlos R- Rivas, a blackmail victim. Um, Ramon Hubert plays Teferio Ramos, a gangster. Uh, uncredited, uh, Ramon Ardid plays Pepe, um, Al Pereira's assistant. And it's funny, so he's like Leon Romay's husband in this, and he, in, I mean, in real life. And he's almost a cuckold in the story, in real life, in the story, because he plays Franco's assistant, and he's kind of the dumb, kind of sad sack and on screen Franco basically has his way with Lena Romay and Martine Steedle sexually and all the way through and he has to just kind of sit there and watch why that goes on with his wife anyway it's really interesting as you see through the lens of real life um so also we have Benny Cardoso is Rita the nightclub bartender and Al's sometime lover uh Peggy Markoff uh She's the woman who talks to Pereira at the nightclub. Uh, Paul Mueller plays Inspector Mendoza. Ronald Weiss plays Henry, Mendoza's assistant. And Monica Swim is Olga Ramos, Tiberio's Ramon's real wife. So yeah, you have a lot of the uh, regulars, Franco's crew. You got Benny Cardoso and Peggy Markoff and Paul Mueller and Ronald Weiss and Monica Swim and Lena Romay and Eric Falk is more of the uh, Dietrich guy. Um, Ramon Ardid, Martin Steedle, and uh, yeah, so this is this is a good uh, a mix of a lot of his his repertory crew and people that did this with him. Um, some of the production notes in that I'm um, getting off of, of course, Flowers of Perversion, The Delirious Cinema of Jesus Franco, Volume Two by Stephen Thrower. Uh, production notes on this. <clears throat> Next before the camera was Downtown, a very low budget effort with Franco in a starring role as the hapless private eye Al Pereira. Manipulated into a world of trouble by femme fatale Lena Romay. 
Made hot on the heels of barbed wire dolls, it features many of the same cast members. Lena Romay, Monica Swim, Paul Mueller, Peggy Markoff, Benny, Mar- Benny Cardoso, Eric Falk, Martine Steedle, Ronald Weiss, Ramon Ardid, and locations as seen in Women Behind Bars. As Monica Swim explained to the author of this, Stephen Thrower, Jess had just rented a house, ground level plus one floor, with a little garden in Belu. It was his base for the period. Lena, Ramon, and I were, quart- were quartered there with him. Some scenes were shot there in, these, in this pavilion for the Fraufenfagenis, and very likely for downtown, but I am not 100% sure. My single appearance, a few seconds in downtown, going down a staircase, was shot at a big, luxurious, ancient property in this neighborhood of another city, probably Nice. It was a scene with Jess, Paul Mueller, and also Ronald Weiss. I think, knowing Jess, he surely used that place in more than one of the films he made that year on the Riviera. And, uh, let's see. So, um, what else do I want to go? Um... So yeah, they talk about uh, Franco as a lead. Um, so yeah, like to me, before I go into that, my own personal thing, watching this, coming from a wrestling background, um, with a wrestling mindset, professional wrestling, this is like a, totally to me like a hero package film. Uh, basically like, Jess Franco booked himself on top. He's like the hero. He gets to have his... So like in this, I think he was about 44 maybe, something like that. And he uh, basically has sex with uh, an 18-year-old girl. Has a threesome with an 18-year-old, beautiful Martine Steedle, and about 21, something like that, year old Lena Romay. So, uh, yeah, and he's... Uh, and also, and uh, Benny Cardoso, he has a scene with, you know, where he gets to fill her boobs and stuff. And and, and why his wife was a script supervisor as well. So, yeah, he's uh, definitely... This is a, uh, the, the hero package, and he's like the booker book... Uh, booking himself on top, um, yeah, that that to me is like pretty thing. So anyway, back to the book. He says uh, downtown is also an example, not quite as shocking as Sexorcism, the hardcore version of Exorcism discussed in Volume One, but still worth noting as Franco displays his own lustful nature on screen. We see him in a threesome with Romé and Martine Steedle, and though he remains clothed the whole time, there's something quite impressive about a well-known movie director nibbling at his partner's nipples and fingering her pussy on screen. It's hard to imagine Tim Burton and Helena Bonham Carter being so bold. While these metatextual double entendres are often trivial in themselves, they contribute to a sense that layers of reality are mingling and superimposing, as Franco's prolific output brings him closer and closer to a sort of Goddardian fusion of fact and fiction, in which shooting a story and living a life are meshed in ironic synchronicity. Franco on screen. Jess is a constant delight in this film, delivering, along with exorcism, his most sustained and revealing performance. Note, too, how affectionate and tolerant is Al Pereira's relationship with Benny Cardoso's character Rita. Even though she's his sometimes lover, she offers him sage advice on the much younger woman with whom he's becoming obsessed. It's evident from the way Cardoso and Franco interact that they share a warmth and familiarity with each other. Cardoso had just... Cardoso had been acting for Franco since 1968's The Girl from Rio. One also wonders whether the character of Rita is a sketch of Franco's then-wife, Nicole, who must surely have been aware by then of Franco's wandering eye and his gradually increasing erotic fascination with Romé. Cast and Crew During his stay in the south of France, Franco relied heavily upon the support of two new cast members, 18-year-old beauty Martine Steedle and the villainous-looking Ronald Weiss. Their work for Franco begins and ends with this run of five adjacent productions. Barbed Wire Dolls, Downtown, The Slaves, Die Marquise Von Saad, and The Contentious Women Behind Bars. Along with Lena Romay and her young husband Ramon Ardid, who are now firmly ensconced as regulars, Steele and Weiss were joined by members of the extended Franco family who would fly to the coast when required. Close friend Monica Swim was the most frequently involved, She's in Midnight Party, Shining Sex, Barbed Wire Dolls, Downtown, and Die Marquise von Saad, while Paul Mueller and Benny Cardoso dropped in for Barbed Wire Dolls and Downtown. Cardoso, a Brazilian actress whom Franco first met while filming The Girl from Rio in 1968, traveled to Italy in the mid-70s. During a visit to the actor Paul Mueller, she met Mueller's son, and they, began, and they became a couple. 
which explains how Cardoso and Mueller Sr. came to appear together in barbed wire dolls and downtown. But although the films were Erwin Dietrich productions, none of the producers, Swiss or German performers, were invited to join Franco on location. Instead, scenes with Dietrich's repertory actors like Eric Falk, Roman Huber, and Peggy Markov were shot back in Zurich the following month. Perhaps the price of airfare made filming them on location impractical, or, perfa- or perhaps given Franco's habit of squirreling footage away for th- use elsewhere, the presence of actors loyal to Dietrich would have cramped his style. Music. Daniel White was contracted to provide music for the film, but although he duly recorded roughly an hour's worth of music, for some reason, most of it went unused. The only exception was a jaunty little jazz number with a scatty female vocal sung in a vague simulation of English. The rest of the soundtrack was culled from the same Walter Baumgartner library cues that would proliferate in all of Franco's future films for Dietrich. Indeed, many of them can be heard in Dietrich's own films. For instance, Downtown's title theme was used for the opening credit of Dietrich's Frauen, die für Sex, Bells, Kann, 1974. Locations, allegedly set on the island of Porto Santo, the northesternmost island on the Madeira Archipelago. Downtown was actually shot in Belleau sur Mer, the same French resort seen in Women Behind Bars. The gleaming white casino on Avenue Fernando Duncan can be seen in both films. When Peria has a bath with his friend Rita and then walks into her living room, we can see from the view outside that we're in the same room as the Don Gregorio Hotel, overlooking Belleau sur Mer railway station. That was used as Milton Warren's hotel room in Women Behind Bars, which means that these two films were shot almost concurrently. Yeah, on a side note, when I watched that, that's the first thing I said. Hey, that's the room from Women Behind Bars, because you could tell because uh, there was a uh, little radio next to the bed that was on the wall and uh, the same black uh, end table and the black headboard and uh, it was right next to the bathroom. And you could just tell it was too too similar. <clears throat> All right, back to the book. The exterior of Cynthia's palatial villa is Belleau sur Mer at the junction of Boulevard de Marco, Le Kirk, and Rue de Port. When we meet the real Miss Ramos, played by Monica Swim, the interior of her home is the prison warden's reception room in Women Behind Bars and the governor's abode in Barbed Wire Dolls. This location is one of the few directly linking Women Behind Bars and Barbed Wire Dolls, two films with a toward background history. But we talked about that in the last two episodes. <clears throat> All the scenes in Lola's apartments were shot on set at Dietrich Studios in Zurich. Connection. Al Pereira is back following his Howard Vernon incarnation in 1972's Les Ebranales. When Pereira visits Cynthia backstage at the nightclub where she works as a stripper, stills of Romay performing in her most recent pictures, Midnight Party, Shining Sex, and Julia to 69 are pinned to the wall. Yeah, I, I noticed that, too. I, I pointed that out to Eric. I said, oh, look, those are pictures from... And they were in this book as well, the stills, because I, I see them every time. So my eye automatically uh, recognized them. Other versions. Uh, no, known, no known variants exist. As an, an alternative title, Les Baus Fonds, The Lower Depths, has been reported, but I've been unable to verify it. Um, so, yeah, that's all the notes they have on downtown. So, um, then once again, this, uh, is episode 10 of downtown, thank you for listening. Um, um, Eric's going to be on again, the next episode, episode 11, uh, Eric Whitwell and I will be, uh, discussing, um, Die Sklaven in West German title, uh, the slave girls. And, uh, we know it here in America as the slaves. So. This is episode 10, film 70. Listen to the review of Downtown. We have a good time. It's fun and funny. Adios. Kleine Ganoven auf der Lauer nach großen Gangstern. Gangsterpuppen auf der Suche nach zahlungskräftigen Freiern.
Sag mal, weiß deine Mutter eigentlich, wie du deinen Lebensunterhalt verdienst? Ich bin Künstlerin, Monsieur. Na, das sieht man. Gangsterpuppen, nehm's nicht so genau. Die arbeiten sogar als Künstlerin, wenn sich nichts Besseres bietet. Ach, Schnuppelhäschen, ich hab die Kerle so satt. Nicht mit mir, die Masche kenne ich. Diesen holden Unschuldsengel habe ich vor der Linse gehabt, als er den Mafiaboss zur Strecke gebracht hat. Wenn man sieht, wie gefährlich Gangsterbosse leben, kann einem der Hut schon hochgehen. Du wirst ihn killen. Du bohrst ihm ein süßes, kreisrundes Loch ins Hirn. Hast du gehört? Du bist dran. Ziel bis drei und schnell. Oh. Liebling, mach's nochmal. Ja. Oh aber dass du mir nicht den Ballermann machst, das ist nämlich eine ganz süße. Ja, die hat den Minister erpresst. Und dann haben sie ihn umgelegt. Na? Gangsterpuppen sind hart im Nehmen. Und wenn einer über den Jordan geht, weinen sie ihm keine Tränen nach. Besser die als wir. Gib cool. Hello and welcome again to the Franco Observer. I'm your host, Jason Rudy, from Desperate Visions Productions, a Sacramento-based filmmaking company. We've done 12 films, about six or seven features, and about five shorts, along with uh, other films and short films and other products and this and that and such. Um, but you know that already, so check us out at Desperate Visions Productions on Facebook and Instagram and all that good stuff. And uh, check out my photography and Mondo Visions uh, photography. I'm joined here again today by my co-host uh, and friend, Eric Whitwell. Hello. And we basically just watched two Franco films back-to-back and watched one before that. So we basically watched three Franco films in two days, which... <laughs> I don't know, the third one was really good, but it seemed like almost a, a marathon. And by the third, it's like, okay, it's time to take a little bit of a Franco break. <laughs> and so I don't ever want to lose that, you know, uh, joy to watch his films. But uh, it, was, it was good. So, so yeah, this is the 10th episode of the Franco Observer podcast. We made it to episode 10 already. So that's cool. Uh, we're digging deep in the... Uh, uh, Erwin C. Dietrich uh, collection of Jess Franco. Um, we watched uh, for this, this is the 70th film that Jess Franco did, and we watched Downtown. Uh, this was, uh, like I said, the 70th film that he did, and um, we watched the Jess Franco Golden Goya collection, um, the Blu ray, the German, and it was a really good print. Uh, before we go into the movie, whether you liked it or stuff, um, what did you think of the Blu-ray, Eric? The actual like the look of it and the menu and all that good stuff. Oh, it was really good, really clean, really good copy. Um, a really, really good clean copy. Um, yeah, the colors were good. Yeah, it's it really, it's a good, good transfer. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I I really like these Ascot Elites uh, Blu-rays. Um, I mean, it's cool watching DVDs and DVDRs and other ways to watch his films, but I think the best quality picture and uh, supplemental material, because they have a lot of subtitles and stuff too, so there's some things I didn't think I'd get to see, but they have the subtitles, and it's, these uh, Ascot Elite ones are really, really good. So this uh, for this one, um, Downtown, Jess Franco shot this. Like I said, this was the second film he did for Erwin C. Dietrich. Uh, he did this uh, after Women Behind Bars, which was the side project that we watched before. So, yeah, we watched Barbed Wire Dolls, Women Behind Bars, and then Downtown on a Row. So it was kind of cool to watch it that way because after a while it felt like it was one big film and uh, a lot of the same actors 
um, a lot of the same outfits, same settings, same uh, locations and that. So it was kind of cool. And some other actors came in and out, but he had some of the same crew. Um, Cynthia Ramos Cynthia Ramos hires private detective Al Pereira to take pictures of her husband, Tiferino, take pictures of her husband, Tiferino, a nightclub owner, in bed with his mistress. Not long after he's taken the pictures, the man is found murdered with copies of the photographs in his pocket. Inspector Mendoza tells Perinia he's the main suspect, unless he can back up his story. Pereira takes the police to the address Cynthia Ramos gave and is astonished to discover that the real Miss Ramos is not the woman who hired him and even more astonished when she backs up his story anyway. As the truth emerges that the real Miss Ramos murdered her husband, Pereira, despite his better judgment, enters into a second arrangement with the duplicus Cynthia and her, synth and her sexy sidekick Lola. This time, he is a willing accomplice in the blackmail of one Carlos Rivas. But can he trust his partner in crime? Uh, in this film, just Franco is the lead. He plays Al Pereira, and it's like the second film that he's acted in um, at this time with the lead. And I thought he was a really good lead, actually. Uh, he's very believable. He kind of plays like a like a detective, uh, throwback kind of a uh, Philip Marlowe type gumshoe kind of hard-boiled type detective um yeah he was believable in this he was uh kind of down on his luck um type guy um but yeah let me go ahead and ask eric eric what did you think of the film actually it was it was pretty funny like uh it had really good dialogue um yeah yeah it was pretty funny i liked it what is it what about it did you like well just uh the dialogue the dialogue was witty um it was uh it was kind of funny like uh like just different random scenes like uh when uh, Franco like jumps onto the lawn to go up to the house you know like he like jumps into the scene or like when he jumps onto the bed to grab the phone like you know it's like he's jumping yeah. into scenes and um the things that they would say to each other too was just cracking like they would say something like, like my cock puller or something like that yeah when he's like calling her different names yeah it's just it was just really funny dialogue you know and uh yeah, it was just a, it was a fun movie. It was a fun movie. Yeah, it's um, it's a lot of like double crossing in that because uh, Lena Romay hires him to take pictures, and then when he, <clears throat> like I read in the synopsis, when he's double crossed in that, you start seeing these different people come into the picture, and then uh, the plot starts unfolding, and then different people aren't who they are. Um, uh, watching it, I recognized. Um, the woman that plays Rita in this, which was just Franco's kind of girlfriend or uh, his girl Friday, basically, her apartment that she lived because she worked in the bar that he frequents and she's a bartender there. Uh, her apartment that she used was also in uh, Women Behind Bars. Uh, it's the insurance investigators hotel room that he is in. I recognize the black uh, uh, headboard and and. Um, uh, uh, night nightstand next to the bed and then I looked and it was the same and then I looked in the reference book afterwards and, and they confirmed it um, so yeah that's the same location there they use uh, they use the same um, palace room from um, the governor's mansion in Women Behind Bar I mean in Barbed Wire Dolls and then in Women Behind Bars it's the wardeness's place I believe and then in this one it's another location you, you'll see it so they used all that in all three films um uh martine is in this again um and uh she's like really amazing in this uh <laughs> martine steedle and i i just read that i guess she was 18 years old when she was in these films Damn. so that's pretty crazy that's pretty crazy yeah she's uh amazing beautiful woman and it looks like she that she only did about seven films uh, five of the seven were for Franco and then um, from like 75 to 77 which would be about 18 to 20, 21 and then I don't know what happened to her after that I gotta research and see if she's still around or if she quit or got married or, or what the story is behind her but but yeah and watching these she's actually a good actress too for her age and, and everything and and she's fearless she's nude and all the way through pretty much every film that she's in she's nude Anytime she's on screen, three quarters of the time she's completely naked, 
And in this film, <clears throat> and most of Franco's other films, he zooms in on their crotch and on her vagina, just really, really close. Like, nonstop, like, throughout the whole movie. Like, any time, like, they would pan and you would see her naked, the zoom would just whoop, like, just right on it, man. It was crazy. Yeah, I mean, really close. And I was talking to Erica, it's funny that, like, just think if you're watching a movie and, like, Julia Roberts was just completely naked and they were just, like, zooming in on her vagina or, like, you know, uh, Angelina Jolie or somebody. That's just so crazy to me that, like, it's the lead in a movie and they're just complete crotch shots, just close zooming in shots. And it's it's funny, too, like, I was watching this as a filmmaker and a lot of times as a filmmaker you, you, you'll start on an object and, like I say, a doorknob or a, a picture frame or a something on the wall and you'll start with that and then you'll pan to the, your, your your actors in the scene or whatever. Well, Franco always, in establishing his shots, he'll start with a close-up of the vagina <laughs> and then pan to their faces talking or he'll pan to out the window or pan across the room or anything. That was a very odd uh, thing I noticed that he was using that a lot in this film. And I, I didn't count, I, I should have made a count, maybe I'll do that in future episodes of how many... Um, close-ups of vaginas are in his film i was thinking the same that thing like good, it was so it was so often that i was like i wish you could like actually keep count of this you know yeah that that might be a thing because it's like you know the the, the thing is with lena all the time but martin he's with and you know so yeah i'm gonna go through now um some kind of high the my little list of notes of some high spots that i caught um and the credits on this Franco's build is Wolfgang Frank as the director. I don't know if it's Frank Wolfgang or Wolfgang Frank. I'll have to look in my credit book uh, toward the end of this and double check. But yeah, that was kind of funny with that, you know. And Eric's like, why is he billed as Wolfgang Frank? <laughs> Which is funny. Uh, this film starts with a sailboat again. Uh, Women Behind Bars started with a sailboat. And then I think there's a sailboat in Barbed Wire Dolls. I'm not sure. Yeah. Like in the first few shots. I don't know about the first shot, but at least in the first few shots. Um, and he does uh, palm trees again. There's always palm trees in the beginning of his of these films, at least. i got to start counting all the palm trees in these. Um, the opening song uh, it starts at a casino again. We see the same casino as in the last film, um, and it's referred to as the Casablanca in this. Um, you basically, in this one, we have about, a, about one minute and 45 seconds of shots before we get nudity. <laughs> and uh, of course, it's great nude shot too to open with. You see Lena Romay in the cutout dress that they use later in uh, uh, white skin and black thighs. You see the same dancer wearing that cutout dress where it's her boobs are exposed and it's cut around her. And uh, what's really awesome about this is this actually is going in order this is the first appearance of the white sheepskin uh rug <laughs> so it's featured prominently in the other films <clears throat> that we reviewed but this is the first appearance of the sheepskin rug and i mentioned to eric that it's only used in the club when she's rolling around on the floor and the customers remark about her being the hottest babe in the place and this <laughs> i don't know it was, i'll have to take those sound cues bites and use those as some of the dialogue because some of the things they say about it is very, actually it's in German so it wouldn't work but it's subtitled but uh, yeah it's it's uh, funny and they only use the sheepskin rug in this whole film and her dance number so it's cool so this is the first one we watched that had a dance number the, the last two didn't have any dance scenes yeah 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 but you can call it real dancing <laughs> yeah it was interesting because you had a, a drummer and a keyboard player and I was telling Eric that's like the shittiest band they're like just buried in the background and Lena's singing but it's dubbed by a uh, German actress. And uh, I was like, this is a really cool... Just, I, I said, just if you're in a club and like that's the act, the woman just like gets completely naked and then just like starts walking to your table and like shaking her vagina at you and like rubbing up against you and put her tits in your face and like singing and like that's the just that's just the act, you know. It's, it's, it's a, called a strip club. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right now that I think about it. But she's portrayed as like a legitimate stage actress, yeah. and a singer, so cabaret yeah. artist. But, um, but yeah. So uh, okay. So here I got my sheepskin uh, plug in, uh, <laughs> and then uh, we see. So yeah. So like, just Franco's the lead in this, and he's quite funny in this. Uh, like Eric had mentioned, he jumps into a few shots, which is funny. Like he's a superhero, where he's like you know extra powerful. 
And speaking of extra powerful, we see him sunbathing with his little chonies on. He has these little uh, <laughs> brown striped little uh, underwear that he wears yeah. like two or three times in the film. Yeah, he gets kind of nude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he gets kind of nude. Thank but... God he doesn't get nude in this, but he, he does other things that we'll talk about later. Yeah. Um, and this is a, basically a hero package in wrestling terms for Jess Franco because in this film he has other people uh, bragging about what she did in, in – um, uh, Bob Wire Dolls about the, when the warden talks about him being a lover and how animalistic he was and voracious and this, yeah. and this is the same way he's just like uh, he jumps in the shots he's uh, you know has a view of himself as you know like he's Mr. S- Mr. Mr. Manly Man and, and uh, but as a filmmaker and director he like puts himself in with and it's cool too learning as because I thought him and Lena were together reading about this but uh She's with uh, a di- the actor who's in these last two films as a prison guard. I think it's Ramon Artie. I'll have to look his name up here in a second. But, yeah, Lena was with him, and Franco wasn't with her yet. And then I guess a few films later is when they got together. So that's kind of cool because in this film, he uh, has a lot of chemistry with her, and they make out, and, and he kisses her and fingers her. And uh, kind of jumping ahead, the, the highlight for me was he... Um, has a threesome with Martine and uh, Lena Romay, and he's basically like fingering them both, and you see it like in great detail, yeah. and uh, kissing them both and sucking on their tits, and yeah, it's <laughs> he's like going full bore. And I remarked, and the f- author of the book that I remarked too, I was reading later, I started laughing. It's like just think of you had a f- a mainstream Hollywood director. And I had mentioned like Stanley Kubrick or Steven Spielberg or yeah. Brian De Palma or somebody like doing that on film, like f- full shots of fingering the woman and seeing the finger going inside. And I mean, graphically shot, you know, and uh, in the book, he had mentioned uh, Tim Burton and uh, and um, Helena Bonham Carter, you know, because they were a couple. And so, yeah, it's funny that he, uh, he you know, Orson Welles never did that or Kubrick. Yeah. So that's that's a first. That's, that's another reason to love Jess Franco that he. Uh, had the balls to, you know, put himself on camera and say, fuck it, and, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, and also, too, you kind of like, as you watch this, you see some of the leering things that people have accused him of, of focusing too much or, or lingering too long on certain shots. In this film, it really starts to kind of hammer that home. Oh, yeah. He likes to keep his camera set below the waist and <laughs> maybe hang out there for a while, you know. <laughs> So, but you know, to each their own. It's, yeah. But yeah, it's it's pretty funny. Yeah, there's no 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 uh, no uh, disguising what he's into. Yeah, and speaking of that, he uh, he's also has uh, purple pants that he wears in this quite a bit as the the detective. So he's like extra cool. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, oh yeah, also too, he wears the same shirt in this that he wears in Barbed Wire Dolls, I believe, and then definitely from uh, Women Behind Bars. Um, so it's kind of cool. He's wearing the same same shirt in that, um, and uh, Lena's also wearing the same peach colored outfit from the last film. In this, uh, it's like a peach or orange colored top and pants that Eric was a big fan of. <laughs> I was like, a big fan of her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The outfit is like, oh man. So yeah, there's uh, there's a nice dialogue scene with Lena and Frank when they first get together and and talk back and forth, and it's kind of witty, and you see that the chemistry between those two, which is kind of cool because then they become a couple later on in real life. Um, me, personally, I always like when they say the title of the film in the film, and in this they say the words downtown. So, um, And yeah, the lady that uh, plays the bartender, um, I'll give her name uh, in the intros, uh, but so yeah, she was in uh, Barbed Wire Dolls, and she's in The Girl from Rio, and then I was reading, too, that she uh, was dating um, Paul Mueller's son, and so her and Paul Mueller have... Uh, roles together and and uh, barbed wire dolls and in this and she's really good in this she's different she's the woman she's kind of like the childlike um, uh, prisoner in barbed wire dolls and in this she's the bartender Rita and I thought she had a, quite a bit of a range in this oh and, yeah and so she was she, she was really good yeah she's a good actress um, let's see what else do we want to say uh, first time you see Martina in this film is nude from behind um, and uh it's funny because there's a scene where Jess Franco takes these pictures of uh, Martine in bed with the object or the guy of supposed to be Lena Romay's husband that you think he's supposed to do this assignment before he's double-crossed and you find out it's not the same person. So he takes these pictures of 
it's cool. He kind of tilts the mirror and takes his camera and another thing like the last film I had mentioned, the tilting of the mirror and this, he tilted the mirror again and used his foot, used his camera and took pictures. So he's meeting uh, Lena Romay and he's like, okay, here's the pictures in the envelope that I made for you. And the camera should have showed the back of the picture so you couldn't see, but you see the pictures that are pulled out of the envelopes and they're actually headshots <laughs> of a woman and of a guy and somebody else. There's total headshots or, yeah. or press photos that are in black and white that have nothing to do with the pictures that he took. Yeah, they're not even the people that he was taking pictures of. Like yeah. Completely different people. It's completely different people. So I think that was the blooper of the film. I started laughing. I go, what the fuck? Those pictures aren't even the same people. Look, look, look. And it's like totally the wrong wrong people in the pictures. And you totally see it right in the camera. Speaking of right in the camera, uh, in this one too, Lena, I always remark about how she'll always turn herself toward the camera and open up her legs. And in this one, she does that quite a few times when she's in bed naked. She'll uh, always turn right toward the camera and just open her legs right in the right toward the camera. So... She always knows how to. Uh, she always knows where the hard camera is, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so yeah. She knows how to stay in, in the shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She totally knows from that. Um, and then you see also too in her dressing room. There's pictures, stills from uh, Julieta '69, uh, Midnight Party, and Shining Sex that are in her dressing room. As to say that she's an actress, and she remarks that there's a kind of an inside joke about her saying that she's not an actress. That's a adult actress and she had just played that part at midnight party before so they kind of referenced that film in there um these are all the same stock music that they'll use in all the other dietrich films the bomb gardener library and all the same stuff they used before um yeah there's a a scene coming up that has uh lena and martine and martine's wearing these like long white socks all the way up to her knees and she's wearing this like kind of orange tight off top and like nothing else. I think she might be wearing a chain around her waist. I'm not sure. No, I don't think she has that even. But uh, yeah, her and Alina get it on in bed. It's probably like the hottest scene of the whole film. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, we're almost had to get up and like kind of walk around the room for a few times and <laughs> sit back down because yeah, goddamn. But and even also knowing that yeah, that's that's, that's crazy. But uh, but yeah, and this uh, they also do the Coco Copa Cabana Club and there's a film he did later on called the girls of the copa cabana club and he uses that a few times um and then like i said finally the highlight of the film is probably uncle jess with the two girls and uh <laughs> going full bore sex scene which is quite impressive for him it's pretty funny and yeah. then also we get eric falk in the film too so yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah what'd you think of uh so yeah, what'd you think of uncle jess with 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 uh, lena and uh martine oh my gosh man it was Hey, admirable, <laughs> you know, like he's a, he's like this chunky older man and it's just with these just two drop dead, gorgeous, gorgeous women. And, um, to just dive right into it. I mean, he, he dove right into it. Yeah. Cause I think Eric favors Lena more and I favor Martine more. So we were both just like, wow. Like both of us are just like totally happy because <laughs> they're both just equally amazing in all these films. Yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, just just the the fact that he's like, "F it," you know, like, "I'm I'm getting in here, I'm getting in here." Yeah, and then when I was watching it, I was thinking that him and Lena were a couple at the time because he kind of goes to gravitate to her a little bit, and I thought, okay, well they're a couple, and he's kind of like paying more attention to her, but he's still doing a few things with Martine. And then when I find out later that Lena had just been married uh, with that guy, and and uh, that you know he was doing that just because he liked her. I was like, okay, it's even funnier watching. Like, wow, yeah. you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think one scene that I thought was really funny. What's a uh, the Dietrich scene? The, I mean the the Eric scene. Um, and he's a uh, he's helping him. I don't know if you're going to talk about it later. No, no, go ahead. Oh, okay, yeah. He's uh, helping him to set up this minister's son and uh, basically take compromising pictures of him with these women. Carlos Rivas is Eric Falk's name in this. Okay, Carlos Rivas, yes. Yeah. And so um, he's behind like this mirror, this one, this uh, mirror. Um, like a two-way mirror. Two-way mirror, this, yeah. this mirror where you can hide behind the wall and you can see what's going on in the bed and they were using it to blackmail people in the past. Yeah, and so he's uh, back there taking pictures and uh, Carl, Eric's getting drunk and they're getting him naked and he starts saying like, I need to see his wiener, you know, like 
get his wiener out, get his wiener out. I need his, I need to see his wiener, you know. And it was just hilarious, man. Was, and then Eric thinks that the mirror's talking. He hears, he hears him talking through the mirror. He actually bangs on the mirror to get their attention, to let him know what he wants. And so all of a sudden, Eric starts talking to the mirror, and he starts talking back to him. And it's just. It's just a weird scene. It's funny. Yeah, it's almost like Jess Franco being a director, and he's like, because I was telling Eric when that scene was going on, I'm like, he's like totally wasting way too much film because like he was taking like ten pictures or fifteen pictures for like every two movements, and you can like, I don't know, it's like as he's taking off his shirt, he took like fifteen pictures when you only need like one or two, and then go move on to the next thing, next thing. But he's almost like barking commands, and Lena's looking at him for direction, and it's pretty funny. Yeah. Oh yeah, the guy that uh, Lena. Um, was married to um, Ramon Ardid. He's uh, the bearded guy in uh, Barbed Wire Dolls and Women Behind Bars. And I don't think he's in this film. Um, but yeah, that was Lena's husband. And uh, she had started doing films with Franco and her husband and her did films with Franco. And then as I'm watching now down the chronologically, I'll see if he stays around or if he's out of the picture or what happens to him. I'm kind of curious now. He's it's like a sidebar, you know, no longer part of the cast. <laughs> yeah. Cause I know they get together. So, um, and as I go through, I'll learn. Yeah. I feel like film, you know, I feel like everyone in that cast gets together. Like I, I, I yeah. it just kind of feels like, like everyone's very comfortable with everyone. Yeah. So I got to find out the Martin Steedle story and, uh, the uh, Ramon Arted story and I gotta see when Lena and Jess got together on what film and, and when that became a thing and, and all that so uh, but no it's cool watching these with that in mind because it's cool to see them as a troop of actors and he has certain keys and moves them through and uh, like Martine does uh, I think these five films for him and then uh, and then she's done and then you, and then Lena goes all the way through and then all these other people come in and out so it's kind of cool watching that with mine you know um and then, uh, yeah, there's also some similarities to this with uh, Orson Welles' Touch of Evil. Uh, Rita's character and him is almost like Marlene Dietrich and Orson Welles in uh, Touch of Evil. And in Touch of Evil, she remarks about his about his weight. And in this, uh, Rita remarks about his weight kind of being pudgy and such, too. So, Because uh, Franco worked with Orson Welles in Chimes of Midnight and a few films in the past during that time and he always idolized Orson Welles so it was cool that that little Orson Welles touch in the film but yeah there's really good dialogue in this it moved really fast uh, a little confusing at times um, I thought it was a step up from Women Behind Bars um, maybe on maybe below Barbed Wire Dolls I'm not sure uh, rating things but I did enjoy it it was it was a different film it felt like more of a Franco film the two dance scenes um, Sheepskin Rug you have Eric goofing around Eric Falk you have uh Martin, you have Franco as a lead in this, and a lot of same humor and other touches to old films, and yeah, it it was a nice change of pace compared to the last two films. So yeah, no, it, it definitely is. Uh, it had some just funny moments. Like we was talking about his keen eye as he's walking up to his house, and he's like, yeah, like keen eye to detect whether or not someone's watching me, and like you just see him like turn around and look. And he, <laughs> yeah, it's like a quick like glance over his left shoulder, and he's talking about how he could survey the whole area and know what's going on if people were watching him and stuff. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, that was kind of goofy. So, all yeah. right. It was, and also, kind of like it's just like typical fashion. Like the way it ends is just it, done. You know, it's like yeah, it, okay, done. Yeah, Lena just kind of gets away, and you know, Paul Mueller's kind of. It's funny too because. Uh, and she killed in ecstasy. The police kind of fumbled the ending, and in this, the police kind of fumbled the ending as well. Because uh, in the film, you learn that Lena Romay's character, uh, she is in with like a crime syndicate, and she's protected, so they really can't bust her or move in on her because uh, the syndicate's bigger than the police, and that they'll have ramifications, and, and who knows if the inspector will be killed or what. So they're kind of handcuffed and stymied, and and Franco makes a point of that, and that might be also with. Uh, a nod to filmmaking or with government or with the law or with the situation in Spain at that time with uh, General Franco. Or, I mean, who, who knows what he's trying to say with his ideological ideas there and such. But uh, no, it's, it's, it's cool. And there's, there's a lot of personal philosophy in this and, and a lot of cool ideas and, and, and rants and things that he disguises as dialogue. It's very, very fast dialogue, very witty. Definitely one of the better dialogue films of his, I think, you know. And I think he got with every woman in this movie. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, he's He messes with Lena, he's with Martine, he's with the red-headed lady. Uh, 
uh, Rita. He's with yeah, just the threes in there, I believe. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, it's only three women in there. All right, yeah. So that's another thing yeah. that he fucking takes <laughs> Way over. Way to and, go, Frango. <laughs> yeah, and he makes money and he gets away. But in the end, he's still a fool. So it's kind of funny. It's you know, yeah. at the very last, sh- not giving himself away because who knows if you'll all see it or what. But and Frango fans already have seen this. But yeah, the last shot is him on his back and. Paul Miller goes, you're a fool and you'll always be a fool, you know. Yeah. And he's just laying there with his fucking fat nose in the air and his little mustache breathing under his nose, you know. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's very good. So um, It's cool, too, his character, Al Pereira. He's uses that a few times, and uh, I know the last film was the Al Pereira versus the Alligator Women, so that's cool. I haven't yet watched that film, but uh, I recognize that name from the title, so that's cool that he ended his film with that character. So I don't know if he plays it or somebody else does, but... That was that was cool. So uh, yeah, uh, that was a cool film. I enjoyed it. Eric liked it as much. Yeah, it was yeah. good. It was good. It was fun. Like it was a, definitely a fun movie. Like, yeah, it was yeah. A, definitely a fun change of pace. Yeah, it's definitely a different film than his canon. So, uh, so yeah, that was cool. This was uh, episode ten of the Franco Observer, and this was uh, film seventy from Jess Franco, and this was downtown. So I want to say thank you all for listening, and uh, this is Jason signing off, and Eric. Uh, Beautiful nights. All right. Good night.